Thank you for joining us this morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Please join me in a, in a prayer. Good morning, Father. Thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity again to come to your house of worship and sing with other people and worship your name and learn more about you. Bless us as we go forward in today and not only today but for this week. Give us the blessing that you need us to have for the week ahead and help us to spread your love with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. a good thing to be in the house of the Lord and welcome to each and every one of you. So excited to see many of you coming back into the house of God. Gentlemen, so good, our pillars of the church here for many, many years. Welcome, gentlemen, good to see you. And uh, those of you coming back, love you so much. Everybody looks so good. Everybody's looking so good. <laughs> God is a good and mighty God, and he is excited to meet us here. Um, I, as many of you know, and I talk about my family often, my family are in town, my sister and my nephew are here in town here, and we've had a wonderful week just doing some serious catch-up, 
you know how important that is. So um, it just makes me think of how important it is to be together, to connect, and to be alongside each other in, in important times. So I trust that you're enjoying that as well as you um, are even here today in the house of God, a chance to pray for each other. All right, a few announcements. We do have Sabbath school following church and we have several adult classes. One is our quarterly class and we are wrapping up the quarter on the promise. And it's been a powerful study on the covenant and I bet we even have some quarterlies left. If any of you did not, uh, uh, if you've been to a different Sabbath school class or haven't tuned in or need that quarterly, it's a wonderful study on the covenant of God. And that study is so critical to our understanding of salvation. So I encourage you, on your way at the door, take one if you don't already have that book. And it's a great way to do your own personal Bible studies with that. Uh, second class, I will... Um, Mention is right here in the sanctuary, and Roma and Leland are tag teaming and teaching this class on the 12 steps. And uh, the way I look at the 12 steps is sometimes we associate that very specifically with certain things. But truly, truly, uh, those 12 steps of surrender and submitting to the Lord God on high is such a beautiful uh, experience of salvation itself and we are submitting to the lord god on high with every sin that binds us you. you creator you father of abraham you guider of the jewish people through the desert lord we ask for your mercy for any slight that we may have done wrong sometimes it's tough for us to admit that Sometimes it's tough for us to face our weaknesses. But Lord, through you, through your grace, we know that nothing is impossible. And for that, Lord, we are grateful. For that, Lord, we ask for your constant small reminders. Lord, as we study your word today, as we hear your word from your servant, we ask for wisdom, for understanding that only your Holy Spirit can give us. Lord, continue to work on our hearts. Visitors, members, everyone, please, Lord, continue with your small touches to guide us towards your eternal glory. Lord, we put ourselves in your hands this morning, today, yesterday, and forevermore, because you are our Lord. We ask and thank you for all these things. Through your son's name, amen. time for our offering and like pastor reminded us we're quickly approaching the end of the fiscal year we have two more sabbaths left remember you can give your offerings online or you can um, give them in the back we've got the offering envelopes available today's loose offering does go to the local church budget the general of the army of Syria was a leper during one of the conquests against Samaria the general captured a young girl and gave her to his wife as a maid the Bible never gives the name of this child, but her influence would be great. She spoke of the God of Israel who could heal the husband of her mistress. The wife told her husband of the hope of a cure. Naaman asked the king of Syria to write a letter to the king of Samaria requesting healing. After several days, Naaman arrived at the home of the prophet Elisha. He found a humble home. To make it matters even worse, Elisha didn't even come out in person to meet the general. He sent the servant out with a message, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Angry, Naaman headed home, but his servants urged him to follow the command of the prophet. When he did, God healed him of leprosy. A little girl shared with her mistress. The woman shared with her husband. The general shared with the king. Naaman came before the prophet of God, and God changed him. Today, we can do the same. 
When we give to the local budget, the funds are being used to help share the gospel with others. Your may, name may never be known, but by sharing, like the little maid, lives will change as did that of the Naaman, the general. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please take our offerings and use them as you will. Help us to remember that to remain anonymous isn't a problem and that our gifts will be amplified by you and to use as you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture is Proverbs 3 and verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths.
Thank you so much. These hymns have been just gorgeous today. Thank you so much. Okay, family of God. Can you turn that up a little bit for me there, just a little bit? Thank you, Greg, for, for the children's story today. And uh, fathers, you are a treasure unto the Lord. You are a treasure unto the Lord. Thank you, gentlemen, for being who you are and doing what you do. You are greatly appreciated. Um, I think about this sermon here today, and I dedicate it to you, fathers. Um, the theme, I have a lot of words. This is what I'm doing lately with these messages. I've got two or three, four words. I'm watching how they collide together. One of the words is trust. And uh, dads, you are special in the world because without, can you imagine without fathers in the world across the board, what this world would be? There's something about men, even though life is hard, gentlemen, even though life is hard, it is true that there's something about you that establishes something in the world, in your strength, in your, uh, in your um, willingness to, to, to stand in the gap of difficult things. We see this, and we thank you. We thank you. It creates a little stability in the world as you hold these things down. We like to give things out on Father's Day and Mother's Day, and we do not have anything for fathers today, and that is absolutely not okay. This, please come back to our church party next Sunday night. I'm going to have a special gift for all dads next Sunday night for all dads. Please come back out. You will be honored at our special event next Sunday night. But gentlemen, it is a special weekend, and we honor you, and especially those men who are choosing to stand inside the Lord. Isn't it a good thing that we've got a Heavenly Father who has our back in difficult times? And we all recognize we need a Heavenly Father. There's, there's um, no surprise why the song, Good, Good Father, is so popular, right? Uh, to have a good, good Father is one of the holiest things you could ever have. And we all know down here we're not perfect, perfect father, right? That's not the song. The perfect, perfect father. Good, good father. Kind of the essence of, of holiness and goodness. And we stand up in the Lord to acquire that and exude that and is such an honor. God is a father. You fathers are a chip off his old block and we love you for that. So this sermon, um, connecting a few words to our story, and the word salvation is in our stories here today. Those four words, let's see how they collide together, and let's bow our heads for a word of prayer to ask the Spirit to do these very things. Dear Father in heaven, we've come into your house today. Dear Father, I pray every father would be uplifted in heart. I pray each one of us, Father, will be firmly planted, even more so this very simple, special, wonderful day in your truth. I pray, Father, your spirit will anoint these four words as you collide them together, Father, and let there be a message coming out that touches each one of us right where I need us. You need it to be, you, you know our hearts, Lord. You know where we need to be touched. We are seen by you here today individually, not just corporately. And I pray that something will come forth to touch each one of us where you need it. In Jesus' name we pray it. And all his people said, amen. Okay. So I'm imagining, you know, there's many different uh, imageries we can create that represent life itself. So I'm thinking today um, of, of this, you know, wonderful ride on a road, on a curvy road. Imagine it's a sunny day. There are many commercials that imagine this for us, right? Uh, so imagine your favorite commercial where the sun is shining and uh, you've got hills and you've got trees and you've got, you've got nature like and the fresh air of nature everywhere and you've got this windy awesome road cutting through such beautiful things. This is life representing life itself and you are living it. You are 
it really messes with things in your mind. We have to live, and it's precious what you got here. You're a miracle sitting here today. And God's saying, please, whatever you do, when mom yells out the door of your life, that Holy Spirit voice, be careful. What he's not saying is don't live anymore. Don't hide. Don't hide in the corner and stop living altogether. Please live. Let's just put the helmet of salvation on our head here today so that we can navigate the hardest things that happen in this life. That's what we're doing here today. Interesting. So with that dichotomy of having a free, wonderful, uh, life-abundant experience with a helmet on of salvation, we've got this issue in between those images, don't we? The worst things in life can happen and do happen, and some of you are still trying to figure out how to climb out of that thing in your head. And it is affecting whether or not you get on the motorcycle of life again and live. And in many ways, we're not living. We're not turning on that turn anymore. We're not going up that hill anymore. And some of the things we're avoiding are good things because we're so afraid. Yes? So it's curious to me when this other word comes up in Scripture that's really hard to do because we know how hard life is sometimes. Open your Bibles if, we, if you would, and I want to thank Christian for reading our scripture here today, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. The first word, you know this Bible verse very well. You've probably heard it before, but it's the first word I kind of missed as standing out in this Bible verse that's so familiar to me. But it's such an important word. Side note on Christian reading scripture, isn't it fun to watch our kids grow up? Didn't he look older here today? Really great, Christian. Thank you so much. And we've got all our kids here uh, growing up, and it's a beautiful thing together. Yes. All right, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. First word is our word. Trust. Trust. What are you talking about, Lord God? Trust. God says to all the mothers, be careful. Sometimes the mother's the panic the most. Don't do this and don't do that. And let's put a hedge around every part of who you are so that this never happens. And, and for kids, it never has happened yet. So we just know. We just know things, right? So be careful. Be careful. And God calls out a Bible verse, trust. Oh, trust. How do you trust? How do you trust in this world? How valuable how valuable is trust in the name of God in this world? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, isn't that a familiar phrase? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Come on, there's parts of my heart that don't trust in the Lord yet. There's other parts that do. I can speak it with my mouth, so familiar to me. But it's such an important word. Side note on Christian reading scripture. Isn't it fun to watch our kids grow up? Didn't he look older here today? Really great, Christian. Thank you so much. And we've got all our kids here uh, growing up, and it's a beautiful thing together. Yes. All right, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. First word is our word, trust. Trust. What are you talking about, Lord God? Trust. God says to all the mothers, be careful. Sometimes the mothers the panic the most. Don't do this and don't do that. And let's put a hedge around every part of who you are so that this never happens. And, and for kids, it never has happened yet. So we just know. We just know things, right? So be careful. Be careful. And God calls out a Bible verse, trust. Oh, trust. How do you trust? How do you trust in this world? How valuable how valuable is trust in the name of God in this world? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, isn't that a familiar phrase?
phrase, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Come on, there's parts of my heart that don't trust in the Lord yet. There's other parts that do. I can speak it with my mouth, but I can tell the parts when I get anxious or, or a little bit of anxiety. Do you have anxiety? These are clues. Your anxiety, your fear, uh, everything that was triggered in 2020 and 2021, everything that's being triggered inside of us, those are clues that there's some little piece that's really struggling with trust the Lord your God, and usually for good reasons, right? We've seen the world, we, and it's not even just what happens in the world. It's, it's, really, it's really that I know how finite I am to handle things. I can handle and be on top of a good chunk of things. I'm, I'm pretty good at handling a good chunk of things. But there are some things that look so big that I realize I'm not big enough to handle all things. So there's parts of my heart I need to kind of work out with God on my trust. The, the areas, it's not just anxiety that are the clues for us of where we're not trusting God with all our heart. It's not just there. Here's the other set of clues on where you're not trusting the Lord your God with all your heart. It's what you're doing to make life safer for you that is also a clue. Usually in these spaces, you're doing something, I'm doing something, I'm choosing something to, to secure something I need inside of me, but it's not the whole package. It's not really the thing that actually does the work, but I'm choosing it anyway, and I'm, my grip is hard on it. What is that in your name? We can all list something. It'll be something different. So don't say, Pastor, you're talking about me. Okay? Because all of us have something we're holding on tight to. All of us do. And it, it, it's a clue. The grip on it is the clue. It may be a halfway decent thing to, to know and be associated with and be connected to. It might even be a good thing. It's just the grip you got. Why are you holding on so tight? to that. Well, because my life depends on it in some part of me. That's a clue. If you're trusting in the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, do you have to hold on so tight to that? Father, help. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Let's go on. And lean not on your own understanding, because then you know what? We come so smart around the things we hold on tight to. That's one way we also protect the fact that we're holding on tight to it. It's my way of surviving and uh, being in control of life and managing life well. It's what I'm doing to control things. And um, I'm holding on tight. And I have created my own understanding around it. I'm so smart. Are you? Oh my goodness, we could have nice conversations about what I've learned in this life and how I do this and how I do that. And what we've done is just created our own understanding on how I'm making it go. And it's based on protecting the things you're gripping. Isn't it? We're so smart. But God says, lean not on your own understanding. Oh, Father, that's hard to do. That's really hard to do. And then, do you hear his superlatives in this Bible verse? I would prefer if he would just soften that up a little bit. You know, I would prefer trust in the Lord your God as much as you can. And uh, lean not on all your thinking, you know, because some of it's pretty good. You're so smart. And uh, then the next part, and in, in, in the ways that you can acknowledge him, in the ways that he's proven himself to you, acknowledge him. In the ways that you're able to see him, acknowledge him. Uh, that's what I would prefer this Bible verse to say. And in fact, I think that's what I think it says, even though it says something different. 
Instead, what does it say? In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Whenever we do that, whenever I do that, acknowledge him in all my ways. I, I start with the places I acknowledge him, but I acknowledge him <laughs> in some of the ways. And here's some of the ways, Lord, I acknowledge you. Here they are. I go to church. I like to do this and that. Those are ways I acknowledge you. But then he says, in all your ways, acknowledge me. And I get to those grippy parts of myself. And I'm like, oh, to acknowledge you there tells on me. To acknowledge you in the parts I'm gripping on something so tight. Uh, you're, to acknowledge you standing there while I'm gripping this thing so tight. You who are God. You who are, am I not all powerful? God stand, standing there with us gripping onto this tiny little thing over here with our life like it's everything. And, and God's standing there. And if God's standing there, imagine his majesty. He's big. You can't even see him. You can't even name him. He created the universe. He created you. He created that thing you're holding on to. He can do anything to it with a puff of air. He can knock it over. He could take it out of your hand. Oh, that happens too. He is all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all loving as he looks at you there, all loving, and he's just standing there. How do I acknowledge him in all things? And when I do, maybe I'm still holding on, but he, we're having this conversation. Oh, that's where real prayer happens. I hope you're praying like that. I hope in your quiet place you're praying about that, this thing you're holding on to. Acknowledge him in all our ways. And it tells on me, but actually I project it on him. I say, God, I'm holding on so tight to this thing over here that makes me, because you know why? It makes me feel special in front of people. I feel cool about something. Or, God, I'm holding on so tight to this because you know what you let happen to me this many years ago? You didn't show up as strong for me in this situation back then. Therefore, why should I trust you today with the grip I have on this thing? And God's still saying, am I not strong enough to make all things good for those who love him? And he just puts a question back onto us. We're like, I'm really not sure I can trust you with all my heart. I'm not sure I trust. And then we get honest. <laughs> it's not really about you, Lord God. I, I don't, you keep telling me that you can and you will. You keep telling me that you have done everything to make it possible. But I still don't really believe you in these places. That's my truth, and when I acknowledge you, that's what I say. But maybe I stand there just a pinch further, and I notice even as I think about it, my grip loosened just a pinch, because I say to myself, and just a little pinch of faith and belief, I say, okay, Lord, though I don't trust you, please reveal yourself as one trustworthy. Please help me see another piece more. Please, Lord, my ways aren't your ways. Therefore, I don't know how it is that you can let bad things happen in this world that mess with our minds so much, but somehow you keep telling me you can fix it and turn it all the way around. I don't know that part of you yet. Please teach me your ways because my ways say I have to hold on tight to this other thing. And God says, you know what, here's the sad truth. Your little thing you're holding on to, you're making that a big thing in your head, but why do you trust that more than me? I made that thing. I can control that thing. So please trust me here. In all your ways, oops, it's stepping it up a notch. Not only lean, don't lean on your own understanding, but now in all your ways, acknowledge him. Let, let's change some things around. And when we go through this little Bible verse, by the end of it, he says, he will make your paths straight. 
Do you ever wake up in the morning and you say, what should I do today, Lord God? What do we want to do today? Don't you ask that? What's your will for my life today? What's your will for my life today? He says, I'm going to make your path straight. I'm going to direct you in it. But what we need to do is talk about trust here. Because you're not going to do it, I can tell, until you trust me. Even if I tell you what I think you should do today, even if I write it down in a tablet of stone, even if I say it loud in your ear, you know what I know you're going to do? God says to each one of us, you're going to keep holding on tight to that thing until you start with the first word, which is trust. Okay, Lord, well, I don't trust that you'll save me out of difficult things. That's why... God says, put the helmet on of salvation up inside your head to protect you from the bad things on your ride of life. Let's keep our Bible verses going here. Please open up your Bibles to a story. Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through. Jericho, that's an interesting place, isn't it? What's Jericho? What happened in Jericho back in the day? Anybody know the story of Jericho? What's that? The walls came tumbling down in Jericho? Jericho was owned by a whole different tribe of people, and they were strong and mighty. Jericho, those old story, Bible stories of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down, who did that for the people? Oh, he did. He did it. It wasn't, it wasn't the Israelites coming in with all their force and their might here today and their prowess on being able to manipulate a thing and get control of the promised land. No, it was God. It was God who did that today. Isn't that interesting? Jesus entered Jericho. Huh. I wonder what that could mean. I wonder what Jesus thinks that means. I wonder if Jesus had a prayer this morning before he went into Jericho today. Say, God, I remember all that you did here. Let's remember all that you did here. Look what you did here in Jericho. Remember that story? I'm going into Jericho in live. I wonder if Jesus had an experience of, you know how like, have you ever made these micro little, remember in high school or middle school when you had to make these mini worlds? You know, in micro miniature, uh, these little micro. I wonder what it feels like for Jesus to be him today in the flesh. And from a godly perspective at some point in time was blowing down the walls of Jericho with mighty force of just the music and the horn that blew uh, seven times around as they water, walked around and praised the Lord the God. The walls fell. Now Jesus in, is walking from our perspective into this place. And as he passes through, he sees a man there, and he knows his name. His name is Zacchaeus. It's another song that you sang as children. These two songs, uh, the, the Jericho and the walls coming tumbling down, and uh, this other one of Zacchaeus and a tree, all happened there in Jericho. And he was a chief tax collector. Okay, nice, Zacchaeus. Not only were you a tax collector, you were chief. Good job. You like climb the ladder right on up. You chief collector there. Nice. What does that mean? Successful. When you become successful, when I be- when we become successful in this life and secure some things for us, how hold- how tightly would you hold on to it if it were threatened? It'd be hard to let that go, wouldn't it? The successes we have in life. The higher we go. It feels so good. We, we pray about going higher in life, don't we? Why? We feel more secure. Because by aiming for these things, don't we? We think we will feel more secure. And those of us who are in those place, places say, and we are a little bit more secure. <laughs> Let's just face it. Come on. It helps out a lot around here. It does. Is this wrong? No, God led a lot of people into high places, so praise the Lord. God is leading us all to high places. God says, my plans for you are to have you prosper and have a great life unto eternity, and you'll have everything you need all the time. 
and it will be abundantly beautiful, better than any ride down the corridor of mountaintops. I'm going to present to you life eternal where we are all on the, the most incredible life ever. And I'm here to secure lands for you, like take walls down when there's, when there's barricades around good places I want you to have and call home the land of milk and honey. So this isn't bad. It's just about the grip who we put our trust in. Is it me? Is it that thing? Or is it God? And Jesus can see through it today that this man, Zacchaeus, I wonder what he sees in the prayers of Zacchaeus. He can see through all of our lives. And, and the Bible, when, when you do a little search on your own on trust, there's so many Bible verses on trust, and it often talks about you praying to God in moments where you need him, and God hears your prayers. Because he knows when we're afraid enough that we finally faith, pray the prayer that says, I'm not sure the things I'm holding on to will actually save me. I need a greater God. And for some reason, Zacchaeus is ripe for this. That's what it means for the fields to be ripe. Someone's on the verge of being willing to let God lead their life more than the thing they've been holding to before. Ooh, that's exciting territory for Jesus. He loves this. He will go and he'll make a beeline for the, for the well that, to meet the woman there. He'll make a beeline in places that other play, people won't go that's called the place of sinners because he knows people might be transformed there. He makes a beeline for these places in, wor in the world where people are ready to let go of their grip of one thing, put their whole heart and trust in him. And he's going to see Zacchaeus today, the chief tax collector, and he was very wealthy, the Bible says. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Why? Why does he need Jesus? Why? You can get to safe and secure places when you stand there and know that security all by itself isn't even the point of life. Come on. Is that the only motive of our life? Security? For what? Why? What did he lose on the way to his secure spot? Everybody. He wanted to see who Jesus was. And he had to climb up into that tree. Wasn't afraid to do so. I like that. Something had built up in him before. <laughs> he climbed up into that tree, and uh, he overlooked the crowd. The crowd was all around Jesus, flocking around him. And so he wanted to see him. He climbed up in that tree. He ran ahead, the Bible says even, and climbed into a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. That took a little planning even, a little intuitiveness. That we, I can guess his path. And I'm going to beat the crowd, and I'm going to get up there, and I'm going to be prepared. He's eager to see him preparing the way. What does the Bible say about uh, people who seek him? They will. I think Jesus is planning this too. It's like a little reunion. It's those moments on the beach where one person runs this way, and the other person runs this way. I think Jesus is making a beeline for Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is making a beeline up the tree for Jesus in hopes, in hopes, I will see God. My life will change for that. Jesus reached the spot, and he looked up, and he said to him, okay, let's just pause there. These Bible verses run so quickly. You've got to slow them down. Jesus reached the spot. He's got a crowd around him, there's a lot of activity, greeting everybody, you know, talking to everybody, doing the thing. He's, he's aware of everybody's needs here. And, and then he reaches the spot, and he looks up. That meant he had to stop. He's looking up into this tree. Could have just passed him by. I get so occupied in my head with things, I don't see everything I'm, I'm walking by. That's just how I am. 
But Jesus uh, pauses, and what happens when Jesus looks up? The crowd that's been focused on him, I wonder what they do. The whole crowd is looking up. Zacchaeus in the spotlight up in that tree. And then Jesus speaks to him. And the first thing he says is his name. Zacchaeus, come on, he knows your name. He knows your name. Please don't ever forget that. He knows your name. Zacchaeus, he gets a little bossy here. Come down immediately. Don't hesitate. I feel like this is the way Jesus might give a hug. You know what I'm saying? He's like diving right in. Come on, I want to be with you so bad. Get on over here, someone coming off the plane. You've been waiting to see them. You've made your way to them. You've paid money to get there. We've made the plan, and here we are. I'm standing under you. I'm looking at you. I see you. I call your name. Now get on down here. Don't just hang out up there to watch me. Come be with me. This is personal between you and your God. Calm down immediately. I can't wait to connect with you and be with you. And more than that, I must stay at your house today. This is urgent relationship stuff. Urgent? What's urgent here? Jesus got a crowd. He could keep teaching. He could keep speaking. But when it's a matter of the heart, Look at the priority. Let me just pause here too. And when we're busy trying to establish security, how many times has Zacchaeus in his life with people in his life said, I'm not available, I am busy. I'm not available, I have a job to do. I'm not available. I can't see you. I can't hear you. Who are you again? What? Who, who's the one I took money from yesterday? Oh, let me just get to my list. I have, I got to crank through this whole list of stuff and content and people. I don't even know their names. I just know how many, how much dollars they owe us here. Let's collect the dollars. I just know the impact of the escalating uh, debt accruing on everybody. And I'm going to go in. Now I got my people surrounding me. You don't become chief. As chief, you are a level away from the work even, aren't you? He's not the one going, doing the collecting. He's layers up in his chiefdom, so he's got a team of people who do the collecting. He doesn't even know anybody's name. How much, what effect does this have on this man who's distanced himself in every way from his people, his family, his everything? For Jesus to come... He would have been happy probably just seeing a glimpse of this famous man. I don't know. You get excited when you see famous people you like? That's fun. You get their autograph. Jesus is like, listen, this is what God is about. I see you. I stop for you. I call you by name. Immediately, please don't let a minute pass before you are down from that tree observing me and now being with me. And in being with me, I'm coming into your private place of home, not when I can schedule it, but today. Wow, God, you have that kind of priority on Zacchaeus' life, on his heart? That's beautiful. All that right there is very beautiful. What does God want for you? So guess what Zacchaeus did? He came down and at once welcomed him gladly. Zacchaeus is ripe and ready. Come on in. All right, let's go home. Let's do this. How exciting. What a buzz amongst the people. Now the people start talking. All the people saw this and began to rejoice at the beauty of this reunion. You're saying that, but I know you're not reading your Bible if you're saying, if you're saying that's true. Because what did they do? Why, why do people have a problem with this situation? All, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of this sinner? 
Why is he getting so close to him? Why is he giving such high priority? Does he understand what he's done to me? I have been hurt by him. So all the other people have been living a good life. They're excited to be by God, excited to be by Jesus, excited to be part of what Jesus can offer, hoping Jesus is going to heal their situations. And some of their situations include the tax collectors have messed up my life and I cannot function. They've done bad things to me. They've messed up my whole life and I'm still trying to overcome that. And my mind is still scrambled because of it. I don't trust my society. I don't trust people I'm supposed to trust because usually tax collectors are people from the community that has been flipped and now are uh, abusing their own people. So they're messed up in the head and are like, Jesus, I don't trust you with this situation. I don't know you, God. Proverbs pops into the mind of people. I wonder if Jesus quoted Proverbs to them. Trust the Lord your God with all your heart. My ways are not your ways. What do you want me to do with this man here today? I'm working, I'm working some other words in this story of salvation. And we come to our final word here today as we begin to look at the rest of this story. My agenda isn't to provide you security alone. My agenda isn't to get revenge on all the people who hurt you. My ways include something even more majestic. God's favorite thing to do isn't taking walls down. He likes doing that, but he does that for a purpose. It's not the end game. He likes to make us wealthy, but it's not his purpose. It's not the end game. The end game, his favorite thing to do in a wayward world is restore people. Restore. Now, I was uh, walking around my favorite park, and uh, I noticed this spring these little critters. I, I was walking along, and Pastor gets in my head. You know how I get in my head. That's what I do. I get in my head. I don't notice what's around me, but I start almost wondering, like, I think I'm going to step on some things. And I look down, and there's all these little tiny critters like this hopping around the spring. They're only about this big. And I thought, well, those look kind of small. And next week I went to go for a walk, they were about double the size. And what I'm familiar with around here is every summer they're about triple the size. What am I talking about? The locusts. And they, they're pretty. They have colors in Florida. They have yellow and everything on the, their green little selves. But when they're in my little garden, I've been watering my plants. I told you about my plants. I've been watering my plants. I'm like, oh, no, the locusts are here. What are they going to eat my stuff? And we know that they eat, and there's plagues in the Bible about locusts. The Bible talks about, you know the, what the Bible promises about locusts. Though the locusts come and eat everything in your territory, what does the Bible say about ha things that happen when everything in your life got eaten away? All of it. The locusts came, and there wasn't one locust in your backyard. It was so many locusts, there was not a leaf left in your backyard. Do you ever feel like those bad things happen on your pretty little drive through life? Took everything. What does the Bible say about the locusts and what they took? I will restore to you what the locusts took from you. I don't trust you, God, about that. I'm not sure it because I haven't seen it. I know someone who lived their whole life and didn't look like they got restored. How do we trust God with this? When, what's his timing? I don't know, but he promises it, and we either choose to believe him or not. So the people are looking at this situation, and they're thinking about everything that had been taken from them, and God's saying through this story, I'm a God of restoration. Hang on here. I'm also a God of restoration, which is our fourth word in the salvation story. So people especially you Pharisees over there in the crowd, put your salvation heads, hats on, helmets on, would you? I'm doing something here. I'm not here to make this man part of my... I'm not here to align with his kingdom. Jesus is not here to align with Zacchaeus' agenda of making more money. He's here to restore 
make paths straight and return what the locusts have taken. And they're going to see a pinch of it today. Don't you want to know this story? Ooh, I'm getting a little goosebumps here. Because what does that mean for you? All right, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now, something happened. Something happened quite immediate. All this immediacy in this story. All the people said all these things. He began to mutter, he has gone to the guest of a sinner. They get home. We miss a little chapter here. They're in, they must be, you know, what happened in this whole situation? What happened in the whole situation? Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now. What is happening in Zacchaeus' head? Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. What is happening in Zacchaeus' head? What is he doing? And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. If you look up your Bible verses, you will also see it's all over the Old Testament. Jesus says, when the locusts take back, I'm not just going to restore you what you lost. I'm going to quadruple it for you. That's how good I am. Please trust me. I know what I'm doing. It may look for a minute like I'm siding with the opposite party. It may look for a minute that I'm doing things that don't make sense to you, but my ways are not your ways. I don't have the same grip on what you have. And my end game is restoration, not just for you, but for everybody who wants to put their trust in me. And I can see Zacchaeus wants to put his trust on me. What grip is Zacchaeus letting go of today and swapping out? There's something that happened when Jesus called his name. There's something that happened when Jesus poured into Zacchaeus something that Zacchaeus didn't have with all the leadership he had in his job, with all the things that made him secure in his job. Something happened when Jesus poured into Zacchaeus. Some, what happened in Zacchaeus' life that he had to hold on a grip of all this all his days so far? But whatever it was, Jesus knew, and Jesus poured into that, and whatever it is, it caused Zacchaeus to let go of the grip. Whoa, now that he is now riding the ride on that ride of life that's exciting with the wind blowing in his face. What a beautiful thing he's doing today. He is really living right now. I'm going to give half back and just to honor what the Bible says, I am becoming a chip off the old I'm going to give people I have robbed four times more. What did the crowd, I wonder what the crowd did then. I wonder what the crowd did then. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that, that which was lost. Our final Bible verse for today comes to us in Psalm 145. Let this story be for you. Enjoy the joy of your salvation. Let go of something and ride that ride with the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation on your head allows you to live life more abundantly with your arms held wide open, with the wind blowing through the air, gentlemen, on your motorcycles, living big because we've put our trust in the salvation of the Lord up inside of our head. Whatever is going down, my ways are not his ways, but I have let go. I am letting go of the things I'm holding on to because he has a better thing. And I don't know what it is, and I don't know when he's going to do it, but he is ordering a whole lot of things around here, including the restoration of people and layers and time and stuff I don't know but I want to be part of that life ride that restores all things and I can be patient I want to put the helmet of salvation on my head and I'm going to ride this ride of life and live big the Lord is near to all who call on him 
to all who call on him in truth, so be honest about it. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cry and saves them. Amen and amen. Let's bow our heads for a final word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being an amazing God. Dear Father, give us a vision of who you are beyond what we're holding on to, beyond our pain, beyond our fears, beyond who we have been based on what we've held on to and change us into someone who is so filled up that we can give abundantly like you give and be changed entirely with a new identity in you. With that said, Father, this earth is full of tragic things. Please save us. Please put your salvation up in our heads. Teach us more about that which protects us. It's in your humble, beautiful Son that we say this prayer today in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray these things. And all his people said, Amen. Thank you.